you know, and, and thoughts and reasoning is important here. So you started off by saying, you know, noticing that everyone sort of agrees that the ultimate truth is beyond, you know, the dualistic mind, we might yeah. say, right? But that, yeah. but don't go too far. That shouldn't destroy conventionalities. Sure. And actually, we got to take this thoughts and reasoning seriously. And actually, that can also help us get an understanding of the ultimate in some way, Son Kappa wants to say. But then, so that was like the concern of negating too much, like early masters might, Son Kappa might accuse them of that. But he also says that earlier Indian masters maybe took reasoning too seriously, right? And that's actually the other problem. They didn't negate enough. Uh, sorry, they, yeah, they didn't negate enough, right? And so can you tell us about um, that side of the coin? Well, um, I mean, there's one way of reading uh, Son Kappa's, you know, Madhyamaka by looking at the history of the philosophical thought in the Buddhist tradition. So, uh, you know, I mean, I'm putting it in a very crude way, um, but hopefully it's true, but in a very kind of rough way. If you look at all the way to the Buddha, uh, teachings of the Buddha, you know, for example, although there is, you know, from a scholarly point of view, there's a debate as to what exactly can be attributed to the Buddha himself historically. But there is a broad consensus that at least, you know, the teachings like the Four Noble Truths, 37 aspects of the path to enlightenment, um, the four, four foundations of mindfulness, applications of mindfulness, uh, these can be really attributed to the Buddha. And one of the things that we see in the Buddha's teaching, especially the Four Noble Truths, as well as the teaching on no self, there is an emphasis on progressive peeling off of misconstruction on reality. So beginning with teaching on impermanence. So you learn to you know, lessen your tendency to grasp at things as enduring, including your own existence. And this sense that I, I'm not going to die, I'll always be there. Or, or, or a large part of our attachment is also premised upon things having enduring nature. So, there, so we can see in early Buddhist teaching emphasis on impermanence. And it has to do with helping us deal with our grasping and attachment. Then it gets a bit more subtle, goes to the level of no self. Now in the early Buddhist text, it's primarily about our own identity because a lot of our attachment comes from me, 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 and my, my, mine. And then the circle, you know, the bubble starts from here and then we expand and grasp. So the Buddha's approach is to tackle it here at the source, which is why the emphasis is on the no self of the person. Then you can see in these various Buddhist philosophical schools, at least there's a multiple layers of grasping being tackled. So one way of understanding Tsongkhapa, Tsongkhapa's view of the historical development of the Buddhist philosophical schools is that each of these schools are trying to really refine this understanding of reality, getting, you know, peeling off another layer of grasping. And so in the case of mind-only school, they went very far, but then they got stuck on the subjective side, consciousness, they reified, they turn it into something ultimately existent. Now you have uh, the uh, Bhavi Vekas reading, Madhyamaka Swatrantika, as the Tibetans would call them. They went beyond uh, mind only school, but then they start, you know, ended up believing in some haven of intrinsic truth, which is really in the structure of the logic. That's why they believed in something inherent in the power of the logical form that could give rise to inference, true inference. So, now, and also uh, this, so, so basically from Tsongkhapa's point of view, um, Bhavi Veka, though trying to be faithful to Nagarjuna, is still stuck in some form of realism. So Chantrakirti's reading and Buddha Palitta uh, for that matter, from Tsongkhapa's point of view is the one that has finally managed to peel off everything that needs to be peeled off. So you can see progressive, layers being peeled off to the point where now it's very difficult to articulate what is then left. So Tsongkhapa, in fact, is that until you realize emptiness, you know, you have gained realization of emptiness, 
conceptually as well as perceptually, you are not going to be able to make a distinction between existence and intrinsic existence. Because the moment we conceive something, the moment, moment we perceive something, we immediately attribute to it a status of intrinsic existence. And, and also for us human beings, we are so conditioned from a very early age by our language. And our language is supposed to mirror reality. Our language structure is supposed to reflect the structure of reality. That's why in reality, we have things and properties. In language, we have nouns and adjectives. Okay, so in reality, things relate to each other. In language, we have relational terms that link up. So, um, so we are so conditioned to perceive the world in these terms that by the time we become ab you know, adults, you know, we are completely internalized. This way of seeing the world, which is so infected with this attribution of real things and their properties. So Tsongkhapa is really saying that uh, you know, one of the challenges, well, the most important challenges for those who take emptiness seriously, and from his point of view and from Nagarjuna's point of view, those who are serious about liberation needs to take serious, <laughs> be serious about emptiness because there is no second door, as Aryadeva says, you know, there is no second door to liberation other than emptiness. So for Nagarjuna and uh, reading Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti, Tsongkhapa is saying that if we are serious about this, and we, then we really need to get serious about examining, you know, how we perceive the world and to what extent, you know, we can identify the projections that are bringing to our experience of the world. And so the meditation on emptiness is really uh, not a one-way relationship where you are bringing emptiness to your mind and then just staying totally absorbed in it. It's really a two-way interactive relationality where you are examining the way you perceive the world and you're also examining how that perception affects your attitude to the object in front of you, especially self. So in this way, you know, in Fort Tsongkhapa, meditation on emptiness is a very active, I would even say interactive process. It's not just a state where you just completely zoom out and have no thought. So that's why Tsongkhapa's approach is actually quite different. 